All right, so um, welcome everyone. This is our first of three digital conversations on creating a democracy of belonging. Um, my name is Holly Rose. I'm part of the Green Party um, team. I am British Canadian and um, we are part of this, everyone who's sort of a co-host um, on this call is part of the team that's bringing these live events to you. Um, first, I want to extend a quick apology for the time shift. Uh, we made the event an hour later, sort of last minute. Um, so. For anyone who's watching this as a replay, we'll, we'll also be providing this to everyone who signed up um, uh, as a replay um, later on. The next two events will be at 6 p.m. for the next two Wednesdays. So the next event is with Clive Lewis and Caroline Lucas um, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Um, so welcome everyone. We want to begin this next series on democracy um, by thanking you for joining us today and being open to learning. We thought we would begin this series event of events with a quote from Jens Stoltenberg, who is the um, former Prime Minister of Norway and during the 2011 violence pep Prep, sorry, perpetrated by the right-wing extremist Anders Breivik, um, the Prime Minister said this quote that um, we at the Green Party find inspiring. So um, even though COVID-19 is a different kind of disruptor, uh, we believe that in times of emergency, it calls for more democracy, not yet less. Uh, so his, his words were, our response is more democracy, more openness and more humanity. This kind of response often gets you accused of looking the other way but, and of choosing the, the easy path, but more democracy, more openness, and more humanity are precisely what's not easy. On the contrary, tough, tough talk, retaliation, shutting down borders, dropping bombs, dividing up the whole world into the good guys and the bad, that's easy, that's looking the other way. And what we're trying to do here with the Green Party is um, a transformation of politics to build a green economy that is equitable um, and create a just society. Building this type of society has to be collaborative in order to create the conditions that empower government action by presenting the government with a plan led by science and supported by the population to address the climate and ecological emergency. And all of you here might know us as the sort of political party for the environmental movement, but what we want to share with you over the next few weeks um, through this series on democracy is how we can collaborate from the bottom up and top down and why our current political system desperately needs us to move away from non from binary politics and work in collaboration with the most unlikely allies as those of you who are following um, Project Reset with Caroline Lucas and Clive Lewis um, will have seen. So I want to begin today by introducing you to Julian Dean, who is our Green Counselor for Shropshire and Shrewsbury, as well as our Action on Climate Emergency Officer. Um, Julie has been, Julian has been working with local councillors around the country to empower Greens who are elected to local councils uh, to incite action on the declaration of a climate emergency and bring positive change in their communities. Um, uh, and then we also have Andy Fewings, who is a Green Councillor from Burnley and who, along with his husband Jay, has created a community cafe called 160, which has sort of embodied the root of a politics of belonging. Um, so I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, starting with Julian. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just a little bit stunned. There's nearly 400 people coming along to hear us. Uh, Andy, I hope you're you know, you're up for that. That's quite exciting. Um, so yeah, so I was elected as a as a councillor in 2017 uh, onto Shropshire Unitary Authority, which you know covers the whole of Shropshire, and also at the same time onto Shrewsbury Town Council. I'm the only Green Party councillor on both of those, although we have a few other town councillors in Shropshire in a town called Oswald Street. So I have a few colleagues locally, um, and. Um, then in uh, the beginning of this year, I, I got appointed three days a week to support our councillors uh, nationally with, with climate action. And that's quite an exciting role to be in. And um, hopefully I'll have a chance tonight to share some of the stuff I've learnt about what we're up to nationally. And uh, Andy, if you want to introduce yourself and also talk a little bit about the, about the cafe you and your partner have created. Sure. Th thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as uh, everyone said, I'm uh, Andy. Um, actually, originally from South Wales. Uh, I've lived all over, but now I, I live in 
Burnley in Lancashire. Um, I've been a Green Party member for five and a half years and I was um, elected as the first ever Green Councillor in the whole of East Lancashire in 2018 when I joined uh, Burnley Borough Council. Um, the ward I represent has one of the highest levels of deprivation in the country. Um, so a lot of people are surprised that we can win in those kinds of wards. Um, I'm pleased to say that I was actually joined by a colleague in 2019, Sarah Hall, and Sarah has the title of first ever young Green and first ever woman elected uh, in the whole of East Lancashire too. Um, I'm the Green Group leader on our council, which is in no overall control. Uh, so we effectively sit as an opposition party um, and there's a minority ruling administration, uh, which is a coalition of several parties. Um, and we often find ourselves with the balance of power between the other opposition group, which is Labour, and the, the ruling administration. Um, in terms of the cafe, I, I mean, I don't actually think that we've, we've done anything special there, you know. Um, so uh, I, it, it's a strange thing to be talking about because there's so many people that run cafes around the country. Um, but to, to understand what we've done, I guess you just have to uh, pull back a little bit. We moved to Burnley uh, in 2015 um, and we both lived in uh, Manchester um, where I worked for uh, a law firm and Jay was very involved in um, community art. Um, and as sort of socially active, creative progressives, for want of better phrases, you know, m most of our friends would leave the, the, the city centre and move to maybe middle class Cholton in Manchester. Uh, but we cast our net really wide and we ended up in, in quite a de deprived northern town in Lancashire, um, about 25 kilometres uh, north of Manchester. So if you were in Manchester, and you walked into a cafe uh, that had been there for, for two decades serving vegetarian food and you wanted to talk to them about putting art on the wall um, and being involved in the community, as, which is essentially what we did when we, we first moved here, you wouldn't essentially walk out with the keys to the cafe because that doesn't happen in Manchester. But in a town like Burnley, you know, there are people that want to keep their cafes going, but there, there isn't a younger generation coming through to take those over. So, you know, since then we've spoken to other businesses like florists and greengrocers and, and butchers where the people are ready to retire and they want someone to take it on. Um, and and there's, there's no one to take that on for them. And it's, it's really quite sad. So for us, it was really about um, ensuring this cafe, which had a sort of social political um, position in the town didn't close. So it was a campaign uh, for me and it was an art project for my husband. Um, we made sure that it carried on and um, it's, it's obviously been redecorated and it is now fully vegan rather than vegetarian. Um, but we wanted to see that uh, cafe stay in Burnley. So, um, and then what that has done, I think the reason why you know, it gets a lot of attention is that you don't expect to see that kind of cafe in a town like Burnley um, at the end of a street where all the properties are boarded up. And it's a, a, it's a real sort of uh, surprise and, and gem. People often say they feel like they've walked into Shoreditch. And um, I think the main reason why it's so important to us and to like-minded people uh, in the town is that it's a space where people can just be. And in this sort of um, profit-driven society, um, there aren't many places like that in towns um, that where people can't afford business rates, et cetera, to have spaces where you can just hang out and speak to like-minded people. So I think it is an important community asset. And, uh, but equally, I also, I, I, you know, we're just normal people running a cafe in some respects, so. How has um, the cafe created conversations that would have otherwise not been had by having that community space that's sort of inclusive and approachable for everyone? I guess, you know, I, I sort of touched on it then really. It's just, it, it's a place to go. It's a place where you can hang out and you can speak to other people that might be like-minded, where you can, where the, uh, the ideas for community projects and art projects can happen. Um, and can can flourish in that environment. And there are people who come to the cafe that don't feel like they can 
go do that in a chain coffee shop. Um, they can't do that in a Weatherspoons, uh, but they, they can do it in our cafe. And, um, you know, it also offers volunteer opportunities. So we, we do lots of things for the community from the actual cafe itself. Um, for example, at Christmas time, we, we open up and, and feed the homeless. Uh, we run a pay it forward scheme so that if anyone wants to make donations, um, people off the street can come in and have a no sort of fuss uh, meal for free. Um, but it's also a place where like-minded people from across the political spectrum um, feel they can come. Um, the previous owners are members and essentially run the Socialist Worker Party in Burnley and they continue to have their meetings in the cafe yeah. some evenings um, and so we're pretty inclusive like that and if you cast yourself back to um, when Tommy Robinson stood in the European elections, he came to our town and there was a big aggressive demonstration and, and our cafe was really where the sort of response to that was, was dealt with. So we had people from the Labour Party, people from the Socialist Workers Party, and we sat around and we wrote a letter to the local press and we all signed it. Um, and it, so it, it's a real place where you can come and meet like-minded people. And like I say, it's, it's a space to just be and, and feel comfortable. And I think that's, that's probably why it's so, so valued. So thank you. And Julian, kind of working along that line of um, of collaboration over competition and creating creating space for for moving forward. What are some of the examples that you've found over the year uh, or over the year year as a climate on action on climate emergency officer, um, where having a green in the room has really transformed what happens on a council? I think yeah, we use this phrase the green in the room and and it's I, i've discovered some really interesting things i did a survey about a month ago now of how our councillors are getting on with climate action and um the the returns the returns told me a lot so first of all the, the places where we actually are in administration in councils you know are doing really well and that's something we can be really proud of especially given that you know in many cases we've only been in those administrations for for less than a year you know we we doubled our number of councillors last year and so it's so it's there's been a big change but what was interesting was the number of places where we're not in administration but we are having an impact and 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 it made me think about this whole green in the room thing so I will give I mean some of the best examples examples Kendall Town Council um, where they're, they're doing a, a citizens jury in the town on on climate action so they're getting people in who've been selected on a, on a, a randomized basis and are being talked to about what the options are and what the challenges are and and just to find out what the appetite of people are is in the town um, you know in a really sort of detailed way that that's been pushed through by, by a, a, a a uh, green councillor in, in a situation where we're not in the majority at all um, and you know and there are there are so many examples of that and I think what happens is that you have um, when there's a green in the room it, it just shifts the conversation so within the other parties there will be people who have slightly more green views and have probably frankly you know just been quiet about it and suddenly there's space for them to speak but also there's a there's a bit of a there's a bit of a push for them to speak they've they've got to they've got to sort of step up and i think the same happens with offices with the staff in in councils so quite you know people who work for for local local authorities who work for councils by and large you know they they, they want to do the right thing and many of them i think you know have have wanted to do things about climate action but you know the corridors of power you you couldn't whisper about climate action until a couple of years ago in many places but we provide that space and just just by being there and then if we can also then bring a bit of knowledge and a bit of understanding and some ideas and that's exactly what our councils are doing in all sorts of places then then it, it really does it really shifts the conversation that's great are there some sort of great cross-party collaboration wins that you Kind of got at the forefront I think, yeah i mean i mean i mean first of all there is nowhere in the country where we are the majority party we don't we don't control councils like that we are but we are in administrations in a number of places in lewis uh in in the south in herefordshire uh, county in stroud 
um, in, in, in various places. And in all of those places, we're in power in collaboration with other people and we're making it work. And I mean, I've been following some really interesting chats on WhatsApp by our councillors in those situations, really worrying about how to make that collaboration work, how to talk to each other. So doing things like, you know, it, traditionally in, in, in local authorities, you know, you have groups. So you have the Labour group and the Tory group and the Dem group and they go away and they make decisions and then they all vote the same. Whereas when we've been working in collaborations, we're doing things like having joint group meetings. So there's actual thrashing out of the ideas between the members of the different groups, you know, and I think that I think it's something I think people are a bit shocked, actually, that we that we are prepared to work in that way, you know, that we don't that we don't do tribalism. that We don't you know, we don't automatically vote against a party because it's that party. We do what we think is right and and we will work with other people to make that happen. And, and that, you know, I mean, I'll give I'll give example just from my own situation where where you know uh Tor you know, many tory parish councillors get the need for for uh homes in their in their communities which are affordable for young families which are energy efficient you know and so they are allies actually in that situation even though you know if i was going to talk to them about brexit we probably disagree massively but on on some of those other situations they're allies and i think we we are you know we're developing a way of working with people on, on, on those sorts in those sorts of ways. That's great. Andy, do you have any um, examples from your time at Burnley of, of cross-party collaboration that's worked well or not quite yet? Um, no, absolutely. I mean, as I said, we, we are, um, we're in uh, no overall control and we often find ourselves um, with balance of power. So, you know, within weeks of us uh, winning our second Green Councillor and um, Labour losing control of the council, uh, we were able to um, work with Labour. They seconded our motion on climate emergency. We actually held an open meeting, um, had a speaker from the Labour Party in our cafe. Um, we also had... Um, at the time, uh, uh, Gina Dowding, who was the uh, Green MEP in the Northwest at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, we passed that climate emergency unanimously um, at the council as a result of the fact that, you know, both sides, for want of a better f phrase of the chamber, want, want knew that they needed green support later in the year. So we were able to get something through that, you know, three, four weeks before that would have been inconceivable. And at the same time, um, we've pushed for um, a governance review. We don't think the way that decision-making ha happens at our, our council is open, transparent, or democratic. So we've pushed for a huge review of that. The um, Local Government Association have come in and given training to councillors, and we're in the process of going through that review and considering what changes can be made to uh, make the, the council more open and democratic. And then just recently, before COVID-19, we, we have our budget council in February, as do most councils. And we were able to win budget amendments on um, energy efficiency staff members. So someone, uh, a new uh, member of staff, so creating jobs to come in and, and look at energy efficiency in the borough. Um, we got budget for water fountains to be installed in the town centre and our local parks, secure bicycle storage in our town centres and um, dedicated space for community groups like Incredible Edible to grow foods and, and run community projects. So we managed to get all that through uh, our, our council budget just because you know for the budget to go through and for other people's amendments to go through uh, they needed the support of the Green Party because like I said often we end up in a, a balance of control balance of power situation. It's, yeah it's incredible what can happen with the collaboration but also when there isn't a majority. <laughs> yeah. It makes um, a big difference. <laughs> So um, I don't know if you both saw this, but um, the Climate Assembly uh, put out a report, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, which said that eight out of 10 people support a green recovery and 93% think the government and its employers should encourage lifestyle changes and cuts um, to emissions as lockdown comes to an end. How does, I mean, part of the green recovery is devolving power from central government and finances and responsibility from central government and returning it to, to communities. Um, how does the green recovery or aspects of the Green New Deal sort of 
um, relate to your job and how does having more power as councillors um, allow England to transform as a whole in Wales, Britain? You can, either of you can answer it or I can, I can kind of ask you directly, Julian, do you want to? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the first thing to say is that, you know, we desperately actually need that shift of power that what we've seen, what we've seen through the COVID-19 crisis is a government that is committed to doing things centrally and probably privately using Serco. So when it came to track and trace or when it comes to getting ventilators or when it comes to that app, you know, they, their, their first instinct is to keep it all locked down, is to give it to their mates in, in, in private industry and, to, and is to centralise it and not do it democratically. And it goes wrong every time. And we've been pushing as councillors, we've been pushing for the, the whole track and trace um, thing to be, to be localised, to be run by um, public health officials in, in local authorities because they have the expertise, they know the local places. They have the, you know, the, they, they don't have enough staff, but they have some staff who are used to doing this sort of thing, aspects of disease, you know, they, they, that's what they do, that's their day job. So, so, so that desperate need for, for more local power and more localism is, is, is you know, it's, it's a battle to be honest, because, and, and, and it's, at the moment it's not a battle we're winning, but I think, I think people get it. I think people get that, that locally, uh, and, and so we know that, that local government is, is, is a potential for powerhouse for, for driving climate change uh, uh, action and green recovery. And, and a lot of the, you know, you, you asking about green recovery, I mean, we were using a lot of the same language. We were talking about a lot of the same things in the Green New Deal before COVID-19 ever happened. Mm -hmm. So talking about um, uh, doing something about, about uh, walking and cycling and transport and active transport because it's good for health it's good for the environment it's good for it, it gets rid of em emissions or talking about retrofitting our homes so that we get rid of uh, fossil fuel uh, burning but also addresses fuel poverty um, um, and actually all those things are, are also you know they fit now for green recovery and, and the reason they fit so well now is because they are jobs rich things they're great skills they're real jobs um, and also because often you're dealing with, you know, if you're dealing with improving people's homes, then quite often it, it was the starting point will be social housing and, and, and the, the worst homes, which, which are many people who are in poverty or, or in the lower income scale. And actually, if you put money into their pockets um, by reducing their, their, their bills, that immediately goes back into the local economy in a way that putting money into the hands of the rich doesn't. So, so as you know, so a green recovery makes perfect sense in so many ways because it makes and so in terms of our councils to get to your questions you know what 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 are our councils been doing so you know to, to give the example of lewis which is one of the councils where where we are in control you know they've been driving all of this stuff but also driving it democratically so they've been setting up uh, um, forums on community energy and forums on cycling um, and similarly as i said before you know in, in up in kendall they're looking at this citizens uh, uh, citizens jury to, to drive things forward but there's so many examples so so a great example here just a week or so ago was in peterborough where you know we've only got a couple of councillors um, but in alliance with with local people who were you know, local cycle campaigns, they managed to push for much more uh, radical and exciting um, emergency provision for cycling and walking. There was some money. There's been some money allocated by government for this. Um, and Peterborough really hadn't got a very good plan together, but our councillors pushed for that. And the result was that uh, when it came to the money allocation, Peterborough actually got more than 100% because suddenly their scheme was good. And so that was, that was us working in alliance with people from outside the council, bringing these ideas into the council. You know, and, and so, and then, I mean, I'll give you one more example and then I'll shut up, but the, in New York, I was, and the reason I'm going to give you this one is because I was, I was, I got all this information from one of our councillors in New York today, and it's just fantastic, you know, she's in charge of, of, uh, of housing in New York, we're in, a, in an alliance there, and they're building, you know, they've got, that set themselves up uh, with a, with a housing building company, um, and they're building, they've got plans for 600 passive house homes, so that's zero carbon housing you know and also most of that is going to be it's going to be affordable it's going to be prices that people can afford to live at and that's right across right across the city so you know that's that's and that's in collaboration they've, they've found really good architects to work with and all sorts of things so so yeah so i think you know if if the power was given to local local councils and then if we get a load more greens elected then actually you know the potential for driving a green recovery in localities is huge yeah 
Absolutely. And I mean, it's impossible for central government to make decisions about such a, a country full of such diverse soils um, that need caring for diverse people who need caring for and, and the needs of each community are different. Um, Andy, how, how has um, your time as a counselor, or even during this COVID period, how have you seen either um, uh, parts of the green recovery or the green new deal put forward as solutions or have you guys enacted any of the any of the parts of the green new deal that you can enact locally with the powers and funds that you have i know you said incredible edible was one of the examples of of something you were able to have budget put towards which is part of sort of a food sovereignty program as far as i know it um are there sort of other examples that have have given you hope um I mean, so I guess there's two elements to that question. The first one um, is sort of just generally, and then the second one is during COVID. So just generally, yes, absolutely. Um, I mentioned Incredible Edible. Also, um, you know, we've been pushing really hard on energy efficiency, um, and we've got that member of staff um, through uh, in the budget to look at that um, borough wide we have a borough which um, has 15 percent fuel poverty um, so it's a real issue uh, for people who have to you know on a daily basis decide between eating and heating and it, it it's really quite um, a shocking situation I, um, I saw um, firsthand when I started campaigning in, in my area people who heat their homes with bubble wrap on their windows um, so you know, the difference of a member of staff dedicated to energy efficiency, which will both benefit the environment in terms of bringing down carbon emissions, but also improve people's lives um, is really important. I think that goes to the essence of a Green New Deal, because it's not just about protecting the environment, but it's about rebalancing society and making sure that the people that have been left behind uh, are brought forward in, in any new um, you know, revolution, any green jobs revolution needs to see uh, the poorest in society brought along with us and, and not dispensed with, which is kind of what happened uh, previously. Um, so absolutely, but since COVID-19, it is a bit of a dif different story. It's, you know, I'm really proud that in Burnley, we have um, been having uh, meetings for, for a couple of months now, but some councils are still not back to having their committee meetings and we've pushed really hard to make sure that there's democracy there our council meetings are streamed to youtube and we have we've been having remote meetings for some time um, so that's really good um, but it comes back to the reason that i said earlier that we push for a governance review we actually have a model of uh, administration which means that essentially one person gets to make all the decisions even though there's 45 elected councillors um, and that person has those meetings in closed door rooms with unelected council officers so that is a slightly different picture and um, I think it's been easy to make those decisions um, uh, sort of offline um, in, in a COVID world. But since we have pushed for those meetings, I said we've been having them for um, a couple of months now, it has given myself and Sarah the opportunity to make sure that we are expressing our views on, on how we should be uh, prioritizing um, recovery. We live in an area which, you know, most of the um, highly paid jobs that are in the aviation industry or the motor industry and what we've been pushing really strongly is for um, the employees to be bailed out and not the industry um, and I think that's really important because both of those industries have a lot more to do in terms of their uh, impact um, on, the, on the climate emergency and I've, I've seen Caroline Lucas speak about how they need to be given targets um, and, and I'm all for that as well but really you know uh, the, the, the big problem is, is not necessarily that those, those industries are above the environment which they, they are it's the fact that we only have those two industries for a whole town and a whole section of Lancashire and really we need to diversify and move into um, what is going to, to bring the new jobs of the future um, and we've been pushing to see that 
investment in low carbon uh, technologies and obviously uh, technologies of the future. I think the, the crisis, whilst it has so many downsides, uh, you know, the silver lining is that it's proved that we can do things differently. We can work remotely. We don't have to uh, build new roads. We can just build better broadband infrastructure. And, you know, so we're banging that drum and it certainly is definitely making a difference. And I think the reason for that is because of what I said earlier, which is that we're in no overall control. Both sides of the debate are going to want to listen to what we're saying. Um, and I like to think that it's just because what we're saying is obviously incredibly sensible and should, should be done. Um, but I know really that if they had a majority, they might not be so keen to listen to what we're saying. So it makes a difference to, to elect those Greens and, and, and get those people holding um, other parties to account, even if um, they're technically in agreement with us on, on certain issues. Yeah. Can I just come come in on that because uh, just on that business of shifting the investment, I think that's really interesting. So, I mean, you know, the, you, you talked about not investing in roads, and of course, I mean, amazingly, we've we've got the AA on our side now. They they are saying, you know, we should be investing in broadband rather than in more roads. It's incredible. But to just to give another example, so in Herefordshire, where we're in we're in we're in coalition, there there was a plan for a bypass in in Hereford, and they've managed to they've managed to put us um, a hold on that. You know, it's, it's a complicated process. They can't simply call it off but they have put a hold on it and the result is that the money that's been released would have been spent on that um, by the local economic partnership some of that money is now coming to shrewsbury for a rebuild of a primary care center so suddenly we've actually got investment in something which is good and useful and is about green recovery and is about health instead of building yet another road and it's just a perfect example of you know it, it, sometimes it's about stopping the wrong things as well as then starting the right and our councillors in Herefordshire have four metres That's very exciting. No, that is really good news. Um, and just proves that the money is there. It's just a matter of directing it to the right projects. Um, the next sort of section is uh, around inclusivity. And um, I guess we've kind of touched on this in terms of having a green in the room and having collaboration over competition, but also in terms of representation, the pandemic has sort of demonstrated how resiliency and inclusivity are linked and, um, and how there's not great representation in the sort of monoculture uh, of whiteness in politics or of maleness in politics or of cisgender in politics. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of pose to both of you, how do you think we can increase representation um, to have a more diverse collection of voices represented. And, and that's in every facet of that description. So age, um, race, sexual orientation, gender, class, disability, um, basically all the things that the Green Party tries to sort of push forward, but um, you know, that we don't see in the halls of power, so to speak. Either of you can take it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go, I, I, mean, I think the first thing to say is that I totally agree with what you're saying. I think that, um, when you have a diverse uh, range of people making decisions, then you, you get a decision that is going to take into account the needs of more people. I mean, it, it is almost that simple. Um, what I would say is that, you know, we do value all those things, but we also have to shine the mirror on ourselves. We do have two white men speaking right now, and um, we need to ask ourselves why that's happened. Um, uh, obviously, I think that the main thing to do is to listen, um, encourage and empower those people um, because I can sit here and try and guess why um, someone is less likely to put themselves forward as a candidate or um, join the Green Party, but really we need to ask them um, why they don't feel that they should they can put themselves forward and encourage and, and empower them, just like I said. So, you know, I think in Burnley, we have two councillors. Um, we have a even gender balance because there's only two of us, uh, me and Sarah. Um, we're both members of the LGBT community. So there is some uh, diversity there. But equally, you know, we do not have um, a very diverse range of members in terms of race uh, and that 
that is something that we do need to look at and understand why that has happened. And I think we're all responsible for that. I don't think there's, I don't think we can blame the leadership and I don't think we can, we can blame staff. And, uh, but we all have to ask ourselves that really tough question um, because it certainly is surprising when you look at our policies, but yet nothing is changing. So difficult questions to ask ourselves. Absolutely. Julian, do you want to touch on that? And then I think I think I think that you know the listening job is 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 so crucial. And I think, you know, and people talk if if we if we talk about institutional racism or institutional discrimination, then those of us who are in institutions have a responsibility to look at our institutions and whether that's the Green Party or I think, in, you know, as, as a councillor, it's about us also looking at our councils and, and you know, really digging into what's, what, how are the services being received? What does the workforce look like? And then, and then it's about visibility as well. And, and so, I mean, just, just to sort of on, on the visibility issue, it's, you know, it's true that, that there is, the, the representation is not great, but when it can, we do have, we do have councillors of colour. We have um, a prominent uh, councillor in, in, in Solly Hall who's leading on, on health. We have uh, a councillor in, in Norwich who's made, uh, the, I've had a great conversation with Nanette recently about the fact that we, um, about the mutual aid work that was going on in Norwich and the fact that you know that it's been fantastic mutual aid work that's gone on in lots of communities but we also know that some communities there is that you know degree of confidence and ability to get out there and do that sort of thing and that doesn't always exist, exist in other communities where, where people are struggling more and she was very aware of that and was talking about that and so hearing those voices is so important. But I do, I do just need to say that, you know, in terms of, in terms of women councillors, actually they are completely leading in, in, in the Green Party. So can I name names? I mean, you know, so, so just to go through, so, you know, Lewis Council, where, which scored highest on my, on my uh, uh, survey a couple of months ago, um, Zoe Nicholson, council leader, Emily O'Brien is the portfolio holder on, on climate issues. You know, they are absolutely leading us. Um, in Herefordshire, where we've stopped this bypass and done other things, Ellie Chowns, who was one of our MEPs for the West Midlands, and now she's a councillor there. Fantastic leading that. And those are places where we're in power. But even in those places where it's where it's the green in the room, where it's the sole green, and where perhaps you know you might you might think that that uh, the challenges for, for for a woman might be more um, in, in in more isolated. Actually, Laurie Needham in Charmwood, she's done, I'm looking at another screen because I've made notes because I wanted to name these people because they're doing such great work. So Laurie Needham, she referred the uh, Climate Action Plan that was written in Charmwood to, to an organisation in Bristol called the Centre for Sustainable Energy with permission from the officers, but it was her initiative and it came back with really good recommendations and she then took that through and it's made a difference, you know, fantastic work. Nicola Day in Peterborough, she's the one who, who pulled together the work to, to get some uh, additional cycle lanes in that area and all of this builds on on previous you know we, we've got a history of this so um 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 alison teal was our lead councillor lead in, in sheffield when we were fighting over over uh, trees being street trees losing street trees she, she she made a big deal there and we've got leading councillors women councillors in brighton as well so actually you know the women are leading when it comes to our our councillors i think well, that's a good thing. But yeah, of course, um, with everything that's kind of gone on over the past six months, um, and I know that this is something as the Green Party that we're looking at internally and also um, with our upcoming elections, those of you who are members and watching this, you have the opportunity to vote um, for our internal elections. And I won't say anything else so I don't get in trouble. But um, and with these conversations as well, um, you know, this originally, for those of you that were signed up to the third, the third, um, uh, digital barbecue. It was originally going to be one event and we ended up breaking it up into three events because we felt after um, everything that was going on and all the work that Caroline and Clive are doing together that having um, this sort of um, ripple out of how of how inclusive democracy can work. So the next one is Caroline and Clive and then the one after is Natalie Bennett with uh, Marama Davidson who is a Maori um, MP from New Zealand where they've had great success uh, in terms of their response and in terms of the, the sort of comparison between how much um, people in the UK trust their government and people in New Zealand trust their government and how that um, has transformed the sort of um, unraveling from lockdown experience for in comparison to these two, two countries. 
Um, so I'm going to roll down into the questions section. Apparently there have been quite a few. Um, I guess one more question while I'm sort of reading through those. What's, what's one piece of advice that you would each offer to people who want to either get involved with politics where they live or help encourage people um, to engage with politics um, in their community? You shall I go first? Yeah, okay, so, so, so for me, I mean, I suppose, because my, my, my political history, I was, I was involved in trade unions and, and stuff like that. But so, so digging into local politics, if, if you like, was, was a bit of a new thing for me when I, when I joined the Green Party and got involved and thought about being a, a councillor. And I think the most important thing for me, therefore, was to get out of my bubble and to, and to actually hear what local people are saying and to force myself to listen to a bit of local radio and 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 those you know because i think i think you've just got to listen you've got to hear what people are saying so that that i think getting out of your bubble is so so important um to 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 be able to provide leadership on a local basis you know you've got to you've got to know where people are at yeah i mean i'm a guess similar to to Dewey, and i think um green party campaigning resonated with me because you don't tell people what to think you you ask them for their opinions and you don't promise people action once you're elected you show them the hard work you're doing and you you earn that vote um, you don't tell people how they should live it, you know you share your ideas and your vision and ultimately you share your life with them it's it's part of a grassroots community and very much a team-based sport um, uh, when you're uh, campaigning for the greens and i think so right from the beginning you're making a difference to the people's lives before you're elected and that's really powerful and it's rewarding and, it, and it's addictive and i think that the only thing i could say about you know what's the one thing you should do is is join <laughs> get involved um, this is grassroots up i think people sometimes make the mistake that there is this amorphous blob called the green party that is doing all this stuff but that is not the case i think that um join and and, and be the change you want to see Good answer. <laughs> um, so we have a load of questions and we've got about 15 minutes. So I will try to um, make sure we answer as many as possible. Um, the first one is for Julian um, and you've answered this a little bit, but do you have a list of projects ranked by, ranked by positive impact on health and well-being of people and planet? Bit of a um, okay, so so I think the big the big story at the moment needs to be about uh, right now. It's about it's about uh, travel, certain so transport. So it's about opening up our towns to to walking and cycling. That's got huge impacts in terms of public health and in terms of climate emissions. The next bit is about retrofitting and improving our homes. Okay, it's great to build passive house homes, but we need to deal with all the homes that, that are already here. They'll be the ones that are still standing in 2050. And actually, you know, as people are doing more homeworking, it's going to be even more important, isn't it, that people, you know, come if, if we have a lockdown in the winter, then people are going to be stuck in homes which are potentially very cold, trying to, trying, to, trying to work. It's not good enough. And so there needs to be a huge amount of investment in that. And that really does transform people's lives as well as address, address the climate emergency. So the, those are... Those are I'll give those my two big ones at the moment, I think. Awesome. Um, Andy, there was one specifically for you about Burnley. Someone said, I know Burnley fairly well, and I imagine you've suffered some severe discrimination, even violence. Um, do you have any tactics for dealing with this? Um, I can only assume this is in reference to me being a member of the LGBT community. Um, and I'll be completely honest, uh, it might be because I moved here after I'd gone through the education system. I haven't really suffered any discrimination. I really haven't felt that in any way. Um, before we moved here, um, interestingly, because we lived in Manchester and a, a friend of my husband's called us up and she went to school in Burnley and she cried down the phone and asked us uh, not to move to Burnley because she felt that we would have a really difficult time. and and. And that just hasn't been the case. And um, all I can say is that, you know, every um, every person has a different experience, but I haven't experienced that. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't have much more to say. I assume that's the, the, the reference and I, I feel very fortunate uh, that that's the case. And hopefully um, it's, it's because we've moved on rather than because um, it's happening behind my back. <laughs> 
definitely. Um, Julian, I'm kind of just going through these in order because uh, there's way too many to try to read through them. But Julian, do you, um, oh, we already asked that one. Uh, this question might be difficult to answer, but you both might have personal opinions on why Greens have done so well in France and Germany, but not in the UK. It's not a difficult question for me. Uh, we, we have a, the first past the post uh, voting system and it's incredibly difficult for small parties to break through. That is different on the continent. And I think that, you know, we shouldn't um, use that as an excuse not to do anything. We've got Caroline elected under first past the post and we should carry on. And, you know, if it's harder, um, no one said it was going to be easy, but, you know, there's a clear difference in voting systems and, and the idea that the UK is a democracy is, 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 a, is, a, is a tale. Fallacy. <laughs> Um, Julian, do you, I'm guessing you're probably the same answer. I would, yeah, I agree with that. The only thing I would add is that, you know, we did double the number of, of councillors that we have last, last year. So there are still opportunities, absolutely. Yeah. And I think I'm in, the, in the area I live in, my, one of the council, the green councillors that was running lost by 20 votes. So it really is a case of helping them knock on doors and, and, and volunteering your time, I think, towards, towards creating that sort of um, that people even know that there is a green and who that green is and what 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 they have to offer to to the specific neighborhood that they're running in. Um, another question asks about how to get your um, your council to commit to declaring a climate emergency. Do you guys have any hints? I, I mean, so so the story of that is has changed so much. So you know, to begin with, there was a lot of resistance, but I don't think really that that I think climate climate skeptics climate skeptics are a dying breed I, I really do i think that um by and large getting the, the emergency declarations is now fairly straightforward more than half the councils in the country have done it it's now about delivering on the action actually we need to move the story on um so that it's not greenwash so that so that we have real real plans with co which are costed in terms of carbon emissions, which are costed in terms of how much the project will cost, although often these projects in the end save money because you're not spending the money on fossil fuels. Um, but, but that's for the stage we're at at the moment. I think the, I think the emergency, you know, we, we, to a certain extent, we've done the emergency declarations. Yes, there are still places that really ought to do it, but it's about now making the actions happen. Awesome. I mean, I, t I totally agree with everything Julian's just said, but just to, in case the person who's asked the question is wanting to take some action there if if you're on a council that has green councillors approach your green councillors ask them to submit a motion if you don't have councillors you usually have a right to speak at a council meeting go and ask them tell them that most of the councils in the country have declared this and why why are they sleeping on at the wheel um and and that might move things along yeah one of the other questions is, we need less tribalism, tribalism and more collaboration between progressive parties at both local and national levels. How do we do that? How can we better collaborate with other parties to make sure that we get the green, fair future we Greens have been crafting for so long? There's, there's so many parts to that. There's, you know, <laughs> but in terms, of, in terms of local elections, yeah, we absolutely have to talk to each other and it'll be different in different places. So, you know, I'll, I'll be honest about the situation in Shropshire. We have a massive Tory majority. The truth is that to put a dent in that Tory majority is going to take more than the Greens. It does take, it, it is going to take uh, working together with Liberal Democrats, with Labour, with some of the, uh, the better independents in the county. And we're up for that. We will have those conversations. We are having those conversations and we are absolutely prepared to, to, to you know, to, to make a compromise in order to, in order to maximise the vote where, where, where we can. Absolutely. I think, um, I, again, I agree with that. I think getting more Greens elected is, is absolutely um, the way to do it. I think that, you know, local politics can be quite different. The, the, the Labour Party that we have in Burnley can be very different to the Labour Party we have down the road in Preston. Um, you know, they can be from completely different sides of the spectrum um, that, that Labour covers. And so it's quite difficult to give a one um, brush um, answer to, to, to that question. I think for us, you know, it, it's been really challenging. Um, Labour see themselves as the political aristocracy here. They're very adversarial. Um, and they've really gone for us in terms of negative campaigning against us once we were elected. So that then makes it difficult 
to work with them. And ultimately, I think the issue is that the other parties just don't see us as equals. Um, and until we stand in every election and we are there and we, where we stand up and we're counted, I think it will be very difficult for us to, to have the gravitas to, to, to have those collaborative um, conversations because the other parties genuinely don't, don't see why they should have to work with us. And that's a, that's a problem. I think Andy is absolutely right on that. And, and actually, you know, yes, we will collaborate, we work, work together. But as I was saying earlier on, we know the power of the green in the room and therefore just the one councillor or two or a couple of extra councillors, every, every victory that we win make does make a difference. And it then allows us to have, you know, to, 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 to take on the other parties and to work with the other parties for them to take us a bit more seriously. So we have to, we, that has to be the priority. Absolutely. And what, what do you both think, I mean, we've talked a little bit about this, but in terms of driving social and environmental justice, why are local communities so important for this? Because that's where people experience it. That's where people experience the inequality or that's where they experience the, 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 the pollution or the dirty air. That's where they experience the, the poor housing, you know, and also it's where they feel a little bit of power and a little bit of, you know, if, if local people can get out. And I mean, my very first, I'll give you my very, very first political action was as a eight year old being taken by my parents to uh, to march across the street in Bridge North in South Shropshire. Uh, uh, in order to demand a zebra crossing because it wasn't safe for kids and families and we got it you know i mean i didn't get it obviously i was eight but but the, we won and so people can make a difference on a local level and you know i think that that sort of that's that's why local politics actually is so important the other thing that's really interesting is that you know the climate crisis is a global climate it's got a global crisis we know that but the movement for uh, for climate emergency declarations resulted in people going to their town halls and lobbying and demonstrating and shouting in a way that actually people hadn't done for a very long time. It mobilised people at a local level. And I think that was a really exciting sort of coming together of the global and the local. Mm. Do you have anything to add, Andy? Um, I, I agree with everything Julian said yet again. Um, I think the only thing that I would add is that Actually, I think just our ethos of being grassroots up and sort of the way I look at it, and I'm sure others do too, is that politics is something that you do with people, not something that you do to people. And so uh, I don't think it's um, specific to uh, climate change that we need to work with the community. I think, you know, as Greens, that's in us. Um, and, you know, working with the community and getting there buy-in is is crucial whatever campaign we're doing absolutely and i guess this kind of relates to how to get younger people involved in local democracy which is one of the questions we have lots of amazing young people who've been involved with fridays for future and extinction rebellion and for some reason i guess in this last election possibly because many of them are not old enough to legally vote here but also because um many are sort of apolitical feeling already disillusioned by the system. Um, what are ways that you've seen younger people in your communities getting involved or how have you helped them to get involved? Or what ideas do you have even? <laughs> So the experience of Shrewsbury has been really interesting. So we had we had we had climate uh, strikers for you know uh, uh, on on those Fridays, um, and um, and that was really exciting. That was you know that was a brand new uh, a generation of people getting involved and and doing it in such an exciting way. So they would all meet in the town square. And then they just decided to march. You know, nobody said you can, you can't. No, they didn't ask. They just started marching and they marched for hours and they wandered around all the different sites of the college and just took it into their own hands. And so the initiative was 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 fantastic. And then interestingly, you know, over the last two or three weeks, it's been many of the same people who've come out demonstrating to say Black Lives Matter, who wanted to sort of, you know, in, in, in a in a you know, hugely white town, but nevertheless these people they there's been the same people coming out. So they've 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 taken they've taken it on without any help they've taken on being the new layer of political activists and fantastically a couple of them joined the green party last week so um you know so uh that's great i think similar similar story but uh, you know as i've mentioned you know binley is not necessarily seen as the the most likely to have uh green uh 
policies uh, in terms of towns in in the UK and so we we also had student climate strikes but they weren't um, you know they weren't to the degree that other towns had them but the fact that they had them um, we had them is just so amazing and it definitely is because we had green councillors people approached us and asked us for advice and, and we gave that advice and, and they um, they organized those student strikes and it was amazing to see so many young people caring about their future and trying to educate um, you know their, their parents and grandparents so and also exactly the same story you know I one person who is 16 and um, was involved in the climate strikes but um, worked at our cafe then and um, so we were able to provide some employment before COVID-19 happened and then that person who would always say to me I'm not political and you know political you know, politics is a dirty word around here and, and uh, I'm sure it is in a lot of places um, so this 16 year old considered himself to be non-political but yet um, as soon as the Black Lives Matter uh, movement happened, he arranged a peaceful, socially distant, um, silent uh, protests in the peace gardens in our town. And that happened for three or four weeks. Um, and so although, you know, Burnley hit, hit the headlines for the plane, um, which some of you will be aware of over um, Manchester City Stadium, you know, there, for weeks and weeks before that, there were... Um, many young people in the town protesting uh, for Black Lives Matter. So I think that the minority of people that arranged that plane were definitely um, outshadowed by the, um, the youth coming through and their solidarity that they showed in complete respect and, and peaceful process, uh, protest in the town. That's great. This kind of um, leads into another, another question. Maybe you can kind of expand on this, but... Um, in the cafe you have in Burnley, how have you created that welcoming atmosphere and, and how do people recognize that it's somewhere that welcomes a diverse range of people? Um, and then they'd like you to say the name of the cafe as well, if you can. <laughs> um, so the cafe is called 160. Um, it's very originally named because it the, the street address is 160. Um, and it's on the Lower well, St. James's Street in Burnley. Um, it's actually closed at the moment, both for COVID-19 and also because there is a lot of roadworks happening for strengthening a bridge, which is right next to it. Um, so if you're visiting any time uh, soon, uh, it'll probably be closed, but in the future, it'll be, be open again. I think the reason why it has an inclusive, inclusive atmosphere is because it's, it's not just a cafe to us, it is a community and social space uh, where art happens. Uh, my husband is an artist, there's art on the walls, there's art exhibitions. Um, you know, we have drink and draws and um, we have gigs where local bands play and um, it's a vegan cafe. So that obviously then creates um, a sort of, um, attendance from people that might m might be more inclined to be progressive um and yeah i i think it's just for you know we've, whenever we bring people into the team we're keen to make sure that they share our vision and our values and you know um it's very relaxed atmosphere so yeah i can't really put my finger on it other than you know there's a lot of personality in there from the people that are involved with it and a lot of those people are our members of the Green Party, uh, including myself and Jay. Awesome. And so we'll just do one last question because we're almost finished. Um, how can local communities contribute to the green recovery? Julian, do you want to take uh, this one? Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, I, I think I think it is, it's, it's, I mean, driving the change has to come from so many different places. We, the, the difficulty is that we need, we need the, the, the pressure from below and that is beginning to happen. As you, you, know, you quoted, didn't you, earlier on, the, the, the survey results that showed that people really want to see this change. But we also need to have the power to make it happen. And so, you know, it's a combination of, of the, the campaigning and the demonstrations and the letter writing and the uh, 
petition signing, all of which is really important. And I've seen it, you know, I've seen the, 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 the vast, the huge majority Tory council feeling under pressure from, from that grassroots campaigning. But then it also needs people actually to win power to make that change as well. So it's about, so then being part of political parties that are going to make that change is so important too. So I think, you know, I think it, it needs both things. It needs that grassroots campaigning, but also needs the politics. Yeah. And did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think that I sort of my, one of my mottos, another saying that I use is that every time you spend money, you cast a vote for the kind of society you want to see. So don't spend money in Wetherspoons. <laughs> Can I say that? Um, <laughs> um, you know, support your local businesses. Um, you know, some local businesses will be using, um, you know, renewable energy for their supply and others won't. If, you're, if it's a business that you go to in a cafe, independent cafe, that you frequent, speak to them and ask them, are they are they signed up for renewable energy or are they using non-renewable energy? Um, have the conversations with society, with the people you meet in society and, and you know, tell people that's what you want to see because um, we're unique in the Green Party, in my view. We, we, we go out there and we ask people um, what they want to see, but um, the vast majority of politicians and, and people from other parties don't don't they sit there and they passively wait for that feedback and if you're not giving it to them they will do what they want to do so that's why those letter campaigns right into your mp right into your councillors work um and just you know share uh, progressive stuff on on facebook because uh you know we there are boris bots out there um and we need to we need to compete with that so so sh share share good stuff on on facebook and social media Absolutely. Well, thank you both for coming and everyone who showed up um, to, to listen to this conversation. We will have a replay um, available by the end of the week. Uh, you will also receive an email from us uh, if you ha are able to donate a bit of money to keep these types of conversations free. That would be really great for the Green Party and to help fund a green recovery. Next week with the same link at six o'clock, uh, Caroline Lucas, our Green MP, and Clive Lewis, our Labour MP, who are both MPs for the Green New Deal and part of Project Reset are going to be joining us. Um, so we'll sort of move out from community and, and into national politics before we follow up in, in the third week with um, international politics. So thanks again, um, Julian and Andy and the Green Party team uh, and everyone who showed up uh, and we will see you next week. Bye.